joined the summer school just for the week number three of the summer school, and um, I would like to show you those pictures that we took in Hangzhou, um, in Shanghai, and also in Qingdao, um, and uh, you will see how much fun uh, we had there, and also um, you will see that um, this was a wonderful learning experience uh, when we had an opportunity to learn not only about um, photonics, advanced materials, but also about culture of uh, China and uh, about those beautiful cities that we visited. So in here you can see um, of a group photo in uh, Hangzhou at the uh, Zhejiang University. And also if, uh, we visited the West Lake. We had some very nice lab tours uh, and a lot of interesting uh, lectures. Um, we um, have been to many different places. For example, here you recall the Shanghai um, uh, city of Shanghai and the, the Hangpu River tour that we took. The lectures in uh, Shanghai Institute of uh, Science and Technology. Um, you can see other group photos in both Shanghai and Hangzhou. Again, the uh, West Lake. Um, the Westlake laser show, uh, which was really interesting, and also have a tour to the Westlake, the lab tours, um, and uh, have a uh, tour to the uh, light source facility of the uh, Shanghai Institute uh, of Science and Technology, um, and uh, uh, have a lectures in this institute. Um, then we visited Qingdao for the second week of our summer school. Um, we had a lot of fun there, many lectures and also interesting tours um, in um, Qingdao. Now it's time to have the third final week of the summer school. Uh, I was planning to show this slide in the very beginning um, of the morning session, um, we had some delay with, uh, um, with uh, the technical problems, uh, so I'm showing this now. And uh, as you recall, yesterday we started our third week of the summer school with a great tour to the Great Wall of China. This was really fantastic, you can already see uh, the pictures we took there. Um, so, now, um, we have the third week, and we already had a morning session with wonderful lectures on optical metamaterials. Um, uh, now it's time for the afternoon session, and uh, we will start with a lecture by Professor Harry Coles. Uh, but before we do it, I would like uh, uh, to say uh, thank you very much to all local organizers and helpers, um, without whom um, this whole summer school and uh, the third week of summer school here in Beijing wouldn't be very much for your help. And uh, with this, I would like to um, introduce our speaker uh, for the afternoon session, Professor Harry Coles from Cambridge University in United Kingdom. Um, we are now trying to connect his computer. Hopefully, it will work if there are um, local helpers who can help. We would really appreciate it. Um, somehow. Um, One second. So, uh, uh, one more announcement I would like to make. Tomorrow, during the morning session, uh, we will uh, uh, give you some details on how to fill in the reimbursement form forms for international students, including 
U.S. and uh, other countries outside of China. So make sure that you are present during the morning session between, because between the lectures, during the break, uh, we'll make many important announcements related to this reimbursement. In particular, uh, how to fill in this form, how to collect all the receipts, where to send those, when you can expect uh, the check of reimbursement and so on. So uh, the other thing is that tomorrow in the afternoon, uh, in the afternoon, we'll have uh, a tour to. Um, so we'll have a very brief session, uh, uh, and uh, when we will discuss the uh, international outreach efforts. Uh, but then right after this, we'll have uh, a tour to the uh, Olympic Park and also to the uh, Temple of Heaven. Um, this will be very exciting, so again, you're all welcome to join us. Uh, with this, we are finally ready to start our lecture by Professor Harry Coles. Um, and, uh, he will give a lecture on self-assembled tunable optical uh, photonic crystals. Um, and um, let us welcome our speaker. Thank you, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to be a little bit different to this morning, because I want to talk about photonic crystals, or photonic liquid crystals, in the first two lectures and take you through a little bit of a story, and hopefully at a, at a sort of level that you can follow um, what is really a quite complex subject. So I'll take you into my lesions, and today I'm going to talk about displays, tomorrow I'm going to talk about lasers, because liquid crystals are unique natural systems that form um, photonic structures through their own interactions, and that's really what we learned last week. So before I do that, I have to thank um, the people in my group at, um, in Cambridge, the, the chemists who make the materials, the, the uh, physicists who study them, and the uh, device people who, who actually make devices. So primarily, um, Steve and Vazim Malik who made a lot of the new materials. Steve Morris, who does a lot of the laser work and displays work. Mike Pudnenko, who does the uh, blue face work, which I'll allude to the back end of the, the talk, and Tim Wilkinson is actually an engineer making devices. And of course I have to thank the chairman, the chairman, in fact, Ivan Sailing and, and, and Ronya, um, yeah, and you for coming to the to coming to the meeting. Because after all, as, as Ivan said, it's your meeting and it's for you to benefit. Okay? Now what you've been hearing about are things that look a little bit like that, um, so-called photonic structures, which you synthesize man-made. I'm not going to talk about them at all. Okay, that's the one thing I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk to you about alternative structures to those. So, firstly, what some of you will have seen last week is uh, we're primarily interested in pneumatic liquid crystals where you have uh, orientational crystals. Um, if you can see my arrow, can't you? Uh, pneumatic liquid crystals, or chiral pneumatic, where you, in effect, turn over the plane of the pneumatic and push it around with the chiral additive. So you end up with a spiral structure. And most of you have seen photonic chiral pneumatic liquid crystal devices. Um, in Europe, they're sold at little forehead thermometers, the things you stick on your forehead to check the temperature. In China, they do it with some kind of gun, you know, and they shoot you. But um, in most pharmacies, you can buy photonic crystals. They cost about 10 cents. Okay, you can um, get them yourself and play with them. And they're based on the chiral pneumatic material. Okay. Now we saw yesterday at the Great Wall a very nice example of chiral pneumatic materials. If I recollect correctly, there was a chiral structure <laughs> which one of these guys pulled out and twisted around, okay? <laughs> and you see there are all the colours that you get in the chiral pneumatic reflection. Okay? The whole colours of the spectrum. That is a beautiful model which I will use in all my lectures in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, I've heard something. Great. Okay, so, so they are the real, the real life scientists working on chiral pneumatic materials. 
What I want to do is talk about photoelectricity. Now, last week you heard a brief description of how photoelectricity arises. And if you want to ask me after the lecture, I'll um, take you through a little talk on that privately. But I really want to get you to the effects, because I know a lot of you aren't liquid crystal people. But one of my messages to you is simply, you can make your own photonic liquid crystal device. Okay? So I want to talk about flexoelectric phenomena. Uh, what are the materials that design parameters? Why am I going to talk to you about biomesogens and come to that? What are the characteristics of the materials? What would a display device potentially look like? Um, then on to these funny cubic phases, the so-called blue phases. Called blue because the first time they were ever detected, they looked blue. And I'll show you some textures that look blue. But I'll also show you some textures that look green or red. Okay? And then I'll take you on to displays and lasers. Today's displays, tomorrow's lasers, uh, and light emitting systems. And then raise the questions, are these disruptive technologies? And perhaps I hope by the end of that, to answer that question. So why the flexo-electro-optic effect? Why should we bother with a car pneumatic? You know that if you go out and buy a twisted pneumatic display, it has a response time of 10 milliseconds. Okay, it has viewing angle restrictions unless you have complex optical films. Uh, it has a very low light throughput. You know, the average efficiency of a twisted pneumatic display like you have on your laptops, the early laptops, is about 7%. 93% of the light is rolled up. Now, I want to take you into systems whereby you gain a lot more light, so you save a lot more energy. So the flexo-electro-optic effect is unusual because it's pneumatic that responds in 10 to 100 microseconds. So it is fast enough, if you're a device person, for frame sequential color. That means in a display, you can throw out all those color filters you have. When you see those red, green, blue stripes, you throw them away, okay, and you use time sequential LEDs, lighting lights. And that, that's entirely possible. Um, the other thing is, in a device, and a lot of problems with many devices, is they're not intrinsically gray, in the sense that if you put a small voltage, you see a small amount of light. If you put a lot of voltage, you see a lot more light. Most devices are binary, they're either on or they're off. And if they're on or they're off, to make you see the levels of color, you have to use very complex driving schemes. You have to have um, a time dither, a spatial dither, as you, you effectively, if you imagine it's a Venetian blind that you put in front of your display, you open and close the Venetian blind very fast or very slow. So you have to use a time dither or space dither. The advantage also of the flexoelectric effect, it is the only electro-optic effect in the crystals that I know of that is purely in plane switching. What I mean in plane switching, I mean, no, that's not true. The IPS uh, pneumatic is in plane switching, but with response time of 10 milliseconds. It is a pure in-plane in, uh, in switching of the optic axis. And as I show you, you can get very, very high optical contrast. Uh, if you go and see Flynn's poster, if you saw it last week or you're going to see it this week, you'll see that you can get contrast ratios easily of the order of 1,000, 2,000 to 1. And that is what every display manufacturer wants. Okay? And that is one of the holy grails. Also, the in-plane switching, because of its optics, gives you a wide view. Okay, let me take you through how to align uh, a car automatic. Now, you saw this last week in principle. You have what we call the Grandjean texture, the standing helix. So it's a helico like a helicoidal spring that's standing up. So the axis of the spring is, is down through the device. You can apply a field and the device starts to tilt. The structure can break up into focal conics. And eventually, with higher fields, you end up with what you call an in-plane helix. So your helix starts in, in that sense. And then because all the dipoles are in the plane of the device, it gradually tilts over to that state. And then, with a high field, are white. Okay, all the objects are sending these attacks. If you look down a microscope, you would see you would see a photoconic texture or a grand texture. Here you see lines because you've got deliberately a uh, cell that's inclined to show you that you've got what we call pitch lines in those systems. But again, I'll come back to that. Okay. The flexoelectric effect for a device puts the helix into the plane of the device. Okay, so you look down, if you look down through your system, you have a polarizer, uh, substrate, alignment layers, into outside electrodes, and then the helix sits in plane. So you take your giant spring and you lay it horizontally. 
Okay, so your, 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 your helix is sitting like that in the plane of the device. When you apply a voltage, the spring distorts. It twists over, or it effectively twists over. Okay? So, using conventional geometry, you apply voltage across the device and across this spring. In the flexoelectric effect, this spring, if you like, rotates. I'll show you in the next transparency what that means. It means you start off with an undistorted spring here. You apply the voltage up through the system, so in the direction of the dot there, and the optic axis rotates through an angle of theta. So you have a birefringent material that is rotating in space. So if you take cross polarizers and you put a piece of for example, a piece, piece of stretched plastic between the polarizers and rotate, it's a high school experiment, then you'll see a change in transmission of light. That, in a chiromatic, is the flexoelectro-optic effect. And if you apply a field up or down, the system rotates plus theta or minus theta. So effectively, you've got a piece of perspex that you're rotating around, a piece of isotopic material that you're rotating around in the plane of the device. A few key equations. If you apply too high voltage, as I show you, to, to my field, um, you unwind the helix. And you don't want to unwind the helix, but you just want to see optical rotation. So you want a material with a high elastic constant, you can't change those too much, or high dielectric anisotropy. Sorry, low dielectric, I can't mess that wrong around. Uh, low dielectric anisotropy. If you have a small delta epsilon, the critical field becomes very high. Okay. Right, so when you look at the electro-optic effect in flexoelectric coupling, this is the flexing of the spring, think of it that way, then the angle you rotate through to a good approximation, phi, depends on the pitch of the helix, and you can imagine that if you have a tight helix, it's hollow to one line, okay, and the elasticity, the elastic constant. The response time, and, and this is peculiar to the flexoelectric effect, does not depend on the field you apply. Whatever voltage you apply, whatever field you apply, the response time to a first approximation is independent of the voltage. That again is unique. Okay, so the response time depends on a, something like a twist viscosity, an elastic constant, and the pitch of the system. So, if you want a fast device, you make the pitch very small. There. Because it's a P squared term. Okay? So, for a large angle, You have a pitch squared term, okay? And so you can compensate for the pitch by having a short pitch by having a large E over K. And that's what you do in the materials design. What is isotropic fluid? Did you know? It isn't birefringent. <laughs> Okie dokie, I'll come around this way. Uh, well, the theory of this was, was is now about 40 years old, uh, but it's taken 40 years to get good materials because people did not believe that the flexoelectric effect was important. And one thing that might surprise you is every liquid crystal, or every thermotropic liquid crystal, is flexoelectric, to some extent. Because flexoelectricity depends on the shape of the molecule. And, uh, and most liquid crystal molecules are either uh, pear-shaped or, or banana-shaped. Okay. I stole bananas this morning. When you have a system of bananas, or fluid molecules, normally, if they're undistorted, the dipoles up and the dipoles down cancel out. But as you distort the system, the dipoles start to align. You generate polarization. That's the flexoelectro-optic effect. Okay. You can have a, you 
have the balance afterwards. So, I said any liquid crystal, take simples um, 7 CV, it could be 5 CV, pentol, cyanide, biphenol, discovered, done in 73, so uh, nearly 40 something years ago, I can't count it. Any simple liquid crystal has a pear shape. Okay? You have a bigger volume there to the chain. And if you look at 7 CB, you twist it up into a helix, you do see a flexo electro optic effect. So in here, you get a rotation of the optical axis with a field. And note that they're very low fields, 2 volts per micron, 3 volts per micron, very, very low. In, a, in many devices, you work up to 10 volts per micron. Okay. So you have a very low, you have a linear effect. In 7CB, why you wouldn't use it is you get a critical unwinding field at about 4.2 volts per micron. So beyond that, it, it unwinds the helix. But it shows the effects, and you can go back to your labs and you can get this, these sort of materials and try the effect yourself. It's very simple. To do it at home, you can experiment. The problem with 7CB is the dielectric anisotropy is quite large. So you want to reduce that ultimately. Okay, but it doesn't matter, it shows that it shows the effect, it shows that it's linear in the field. And also it shows the response time is less than 120 microseconds. And there you have it. Response time of that system, about 100, 120 microseconds. In a conventional nematic, that if you switched it in a twisted nematic geometry, it would respond in 10 to 100 milliseconds. There is microseconds. That's the key to the effect. E over K for that system is fairly low. So how do we overcome this? You need a strong dipole because that gives you polarization. You want to, uh, and that gives you would give you good flex electric coupling, but it also increases the dielectric properties. Okay? So you want a system that has a big dipole but a low delta epsilon. So how do you do that? We make what we call bimesogens, liquid crystals with two liquid crystal groups. Okay? They have large dipoles and may have large dipoles, and you sit them end to end. So the dipoles sit out and they self-cancel. But when the system bends, you generate polarization. Okay, so if you distort the director of the effect, if you distort the molecules, you generate polarization. And it's the it's the bimesogens that are key to the effects I'm talking about. So take uh, one, of our, one of our early materials. Say, okay, cyanobiphenols are the basis, or were the basis of most liquid crystal displays. Take two of those and join them end to end. You have a bimesogen, one liquid crystal, two liquid crystals. Do you see a flex of electro optic effect? Yes, you do. There's the tilt angle, 0 to 25 degrees at very low fields, 0 to about 6 degrees. So for a device in principle, a, a tilt angle or a sw combined switching angle of 45 degrees, 6 volts per micron, would give you a perfect device between cross polarizers. If you take a piece of stretched plastic, rotate it between cross polarizer and analyzer, you see a maximum signal of 45 degrees. The optic axis is at 45 degrees as so, an analyzer. Again, you can go and test this yourself, go home, break your quarter with sunglasses apart, cross them uh, across each other, and put a piece of plastic between the two. It's as simple as that. Do it yourself experiments. What this does, though, is give you a low delta epsilon because the light bulbs cancel out. The problem is the operating temperatures are 205 degrees Celsius. Normally, longer molecules give you high temperatures. So the effect works, and it's proved that it works, but how do you make it? Um, work at room temperature, but that's what I'm going to show you. But first of all, I said the, the, the response was linear in the field. There's the applied field, sorry, there's the applied field, and there's the optical response. The signal is following the voltage. We are following the field. The response time, is it fast? Yes, the answer is there, there's your length scale of 0 to 10 milliseconds. And the decay time there, or the switching time there, is the order of 200 to 300 microseconds. To prove something that is important for a device engineer is, I said the effect was uh, in, independent of voltage of the field. It's a, it's a materials parameter. If you, if you take the voltage off, as you do there, is the response time just as fast? And the answer is yes it is. That time is as fast as that time. That's the, that's the 10 to 0 volts. That's the response. And no matter what level you switch from, you always see the same response time. So again, if you're making displays, you're interested in level-to-level -level switching. You know, it's no good if you can't go from one level of light to another level of light and have to wait 100 milliseconds. These guys do it in, in, in 10 to 100 microseconds. And that's 
great for displays, great for energy conservation. So, just to prove to you that the um, system is fast, this is the first one on response time in a pneumatic. I'm not talking about ferroelectrics, I'm talking about pneumatics. The response time is 40 to 60 microseconds. Okay, but the operating temperature is quite high. But it does show you all the things you need. The critical field for unwinding is very high. So you can operate your, your, your device quite happily between 0 and 10 volts per micron. Okay. So you have low delta epsilon, but you have a high constant. So what we did was then go away and say, how can we lower the operating temperatures? And the answer is, if, uh, if, if you look at structures of liquid crystals, you start fluorinating the compounds. Fluorines bring down transition temperatures partly because of their bulk um, very, very, very quickly. So if you have a few lateral fluorines and internal fluorines. The fluorines give you the dipole at either end, the lateral fluorines lower the transition temperatures. And then you see something up, which I thought was quite spectacular at the time, 0 to 10 volts per micron switching angles in a unipolar field, so it's a tilt in one direction, of up to something, no, sorry, two lines, two feet in this case, up to 50 degrees. More than you need, 45 degrees is what you actually need. Okay, two, two thigh or two theta was 90 degrees. Uh, and that you get around uh, 4 volts per micron. Sorry, that, that term up there, sorry. You get about six, 7 volts per micron. And there, about 4 volts per micron. The difference in the graphs here is the temperature. And the something that is uh, peculiar, if you like, to the flexoelectric effect is that it is essentially temperature independent. Okay, because the you have something, an E over K, a, a charge over elastic constant ratio, and they both have the same, almost the same, functional variation of temperature. So they self-cancel, they self-correct, to, to, a, to a first approximation. And um, when you get this on the website, there are some, some of the references to these materials, and the last one there with Steve is one where we reviewed um, what we've been doing with these biomecenate materials, how we make mixtures, how we make mixtures that work at room temperature. What's important? The shape's important because you want to be able to bend and flex your materials. Okay. Um, if you have odd even members, something in liquid crystal is that as, the, as you add an extra CH2 group in a, in a spacer, you kink the molecule and it will kink it back. Okay. And so it matters whether you have 9 or 10 carbons in these spacing chains. If you just skip on a little bit, just if you look at the odd and even members of the series, just by changing one CH2, so adding one methylene spacer, you go from an uh, E over K of nearly twice. So you're doing molecular engineering now, okay? you're, you're, you're just changing slightly structures, changing what molecules do and how their shapes uh, behave to generate high uh, flexoelectric coefficients. At the same time, you do get odd even effects in the response time. But still less than 80 microseconds. For instance, so that's the yeah, that's, that's the time for the double switch from minus e to the plus, from minus time to plus time. Still less than 100 microseconds. And just if you just look, go back to a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of physics, whatever. Um, as you change the methylene spaces, you change the birefringence of your material just by adding one CH2. Taking one away, adding one on, sorry, adding an extra one on, an extra, an extra, an extra. You generate large, large birefringence effects, okay, and the transition temperatures equally will change by 60 degrees. So just adding one CH2 group, one methylene spacing unit, changes your uh, phase transition by about 60 degrees. And that's what allows you to have very wide uh, temperature ranges in mixtures. Um, if you, if you want to look this work up, Jeffrey Luckhurst, who I think has just retired in Southampton, has done a lot of theory on this work, and that's a name that you'll find very useful, because the theory behind how, how and why prime uh, students behave was worked out by Jeffrey many years ago, long before people worry about these effects. Uh, don't look at all the data there, okay? What I wanted to do was show you that the odd members, so at 9, 5, 11, whatever, is the number of uh, methylene spaces in your molecule. I just wanted to show you that the E over K values were high compared with the even members, 6, 8, 10, etc. Okay? They're about twice. The, the uh, notation here means we've used 
uh, difluorinated. Uh, there's a NSO, NSO is a non-linear optical material. You can you can put non-linear, non you can put dyes, you can put non-linear optical commodities into your system, and they will behave the same way. But what's important in there is the response times still stay fast. Okay, 35. The slowest one there is the, the, the nine compound is going towards a spectral phase, but that's still 350 microseconds. Way, way, way faster than anything Samsung have produced with a 240 hertz uh, display device, uh, blue phase PDLC display device. Okay, still fast, still very fast. What we then did was make mixtures of these compounds because if you want to make a room temperature material, you, you, you end up making complex phase diagrams and adding sets of materials together. But note that what I did do was always use odd members because they were the ones that give the biggest flex electrode to the coefficients. And then you can generate mixtures that have very large coefficients. Just to take you through typically some data, 5 volts per micron, 24, 25 um, degrees switching. Okay, a short pitch system, uh, a response time in this case of about a millisecond. If I flip through quickly, a long pitch mixture. Now, this, this may not surprise you, but it actually amazes me, is that the switching angle in this system, the tilt angle, um, is 80 some, 83, 84 degrees. Your helix is de deforming from that sort of helical shape and still staying more or less a helix, twisting right around as the optic axis rotates through plus minus at 80, 83, 84 degrees. So it's almost a right angle. And that's kind of difficult to imagine. But, but it, it is reversible and it does work. For a device, I'm only interested in this kind of range here. 45 degrees tilt if you have had a digest of systems, 22 and a half if it was a normal power printing device. And micro, like, low, low driving fields, 4 or 5 volts per micron, depending on the pitch, or 2 volts per micron down here. And that's typical for a display device. If you, if you were talking to display manufacturers, that would be fairly typical driving. So that's where actually I was going to stop because I've gone a bit fast, but I can carry on. Uh, I even if you it's a good place to run caught up, yeah. Um, so you're welcome. Let's just go through them. So by molecular design, by playing with the uh, esogenic unit, you can generate very high uh, flexoelectric materials. You want to use odd compounds, odd methylene spacer unit material rather than even. Um, and in the conventional way you measure flexoelectric phenomena, th these materials that can deform, the director fields that can deform, give you incredibly high E over K. It's high enough to make, in fact we are making, if it, if it puts you in the right direction, prototype 21, 21 inch displays. Yeah. And people that we're working with in industrial companies do that. So these things do work and they are, they are real. Um, but from the sort of physics of materials, the chemistry materials, it shows you the design protocols. Um, again, to give you high switching angles. And 45 degrees at 2 volts per micron is, is I believe, a display manufacturer's dream. I think that's a good place to, to stop. Does all this uh, chemical structures roam around that pneumatic and semantic phases? Do they? Only the pneumatic and semantic phases. You have all the difference. The, 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 yeah, all of these flexoelectrics huh? are pneumatics. Okay. okay. They're, they're well away from this. Sometimes you have a transition to a semantic, and the cholesteric is a, is a, isn't real, it's a pseudo layer structure. Okay? It isn't a real layer uh, material. The molecules can change neighborhood, but still point in the same direction. Okay, so it, it's. It's not a layer, a la the, the chiral anatomy isn't layered in the sense of spectrum is. No, you do have fluorine as an atom, but when you talk about this um, cyano, this is in group, bigger group. The so does there any... We, we, yeah, the, the, we changed from cyano to fluoro yeah. um, to lower the transition temperatures. Yeah. Uh, the, the materials show much, much lower temperature phases. Okay. So we went from, with the biomission, 205 degrees Celsius to bisotropic dimensions. Yeah. Down to about 100. And then when you start making mixtures, you can go down to, to minus, minus 20, minus 30. Yeah. Okay. But we, we don't just put one fluorine on. We, tend, we, we have put two or three or four. Yeah. 
No, below 100 something, you are thinking something with the single component. The, these materials are what? Yeah, these, these materials, the, these... Um, any one of those, these materials has a trend, it would be isotropic pneumatic at about 100 degrees, thereabouts. Mix them together, then they'll go from 100 down to about minus 20. The whole, the whole phase, the pneumatic phase. Yeah. That, that is, it's why you play with the fluorines. If sometimes we put, sometimes, we put two on here or three on here. Mm -hmm. If I put three, then I'm going to make a much bigger dipole. <coughs> but then I start losing stability of the, the phase, so I use that as an additive. Okay. Any, any um, materials manufacturer of crystals actually plays tricks. They, they make a base material, like the patch like these, and then add in 5%, 10% of something with three fluorines to increase the effect. They have what they call delta epsilon, or in our case, delta E over K additives. Yeah. So you, because a, 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 a trifluorinated material would only have a very narrow temperature range, but added in, it's, it sits in the space quite happily. So you tried with some chiral spacer? Driving? Chiral spacer? Those spacer with the chiral center? Yeah. Oh, sorry, no. No, no, we, um, Many, many people make chiral different crystals. Uh, let's get that, let's get, let's get that. We don't. We add high twisting chiral additives. So I take HTPs with features as well. Twisting chiral, 80, 90, 100 microns, minus one. It's easier to make a chiral compounds and add the twisting agent. Uh, and again, no materials manufacturer in his right mind, or very right mind, whichever, would actually bother to make chiral molecules for these effects. You make a pneumatic material that you can understand and understand well, and then add chiral additives. And if you use the so-called high twisting power compounds that we talked about last week, you only need about 3%. You see when I come onto the blue phases after the break, that, that in fact you get very high twists with 3.7, 2.4% additive. But you normally add, you normally use highly chiral highly twisted structure, but as I think even said last week, to imprint chirality into the system. And then you can tune it, which is the beauty. Are there more questions? Uh, I have a question. So, uh, when one uh, has a goal of very fast switching, the other approaches could be parallel with the crystals, and also uh, one could use very thin cells, but kind of pinches Uh, or even, uh, you know, something like you mentioned, the stabilized blue phase where you basically have a uh, uh, hair effect, right? Um, uh, so, but as you compare, you know, dual frequency materials, you can grow the other candidates when you could use, you know, uh, higher yields. So, uh, how can you compare this approach with your flexoelectric? It depends which hat I'm wearing. Okay. Um, we do make a lot of ferroelectric and anti-ferroelectric materials, but they tend to be for the bistable displays. And a ferroelectric is bistable, but it doesn't give you grayscale you, without time dither or, or, or field dither. Okay. Uh, the anti-ferro does. That, that will give you a great scale with V-shaped switching. But you've got a problem unless you use the high tilt, that's another lecture I can give you, the high tilt ferro anti ferrets. Uh, and you, you have a line you always have alignment problems, I think, with the ferrets. The, these flexors, you use conventional alignment. They use rubber nylon polyamides, PVA will work. There, there is a process you have to go through. When, when I come to the next lecture, you'll see how good the alignment can be. Um, I think the key is that you've got grayscale, uh, a very facile grayscale. I'll come on to some devices after the break where you see it gets even better. But one of the keys is alignment. Uh, and it, I think when people first looked at the flexor electro-optic effect, there were problems with alignment. But we have some other solutions which I'll come to that make it much, much more interesting. But if it's a bi-stable device, now I, I would um, I, I give it a fair electric. But if you wanted the great scale, you must look at these. It's which I'm wearing. Um,
Are there more questions? There must be one question. Must be one, one question. Somebody must want to banana. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's going a bit soft. <laughs> a bit like me. <laughs> okay, here's what sense of your attention. I'm seeing it about 15. Some of the device geometries that are important um, for what I'm talking about. So what I want to do is follow on with how you make the device. I said you align the helix in a plane and then you rotate the optic axis. So if I actually look at an aligned sample, this is the electrode edge here, so that's about a centimeter square, and you'll see that that's quite bright and quite uniform. That's a helix that's lying down in the horizontal plane that's been aligned. That's the electrode edge there, so this is the dark region, uh, this is the light region, so this is the uh, across the boundary here, so that's the electrode edge. And you'll see that as I apply a field, it switches from one state, to the bright state, to the dark state. Okay, normally you'd set your device to be dark with, with um, one polarization of light, and then switch back to bright state. And there's a very good optical contrast, okay? And that's the basis of the flexo-electro-optic display devices in the, in the so-called uniform line helix. Um, there is a second device that we started to make, that we made it for a telecommunications application where guys wanted to make uh, face compensators. And we had a four electrode array. And what I said was if you apply a field across the helix, you get a rotation of the optic axis. So if I start here with a uniform standing, uh, uniform standing helix, now a gradual texture, where the liquid crystals are parallel to the substrates, okay, so you've, that's your classical chiromatic, but I'm applying an in-plane field. Then, as you apply the voltage, the helix tilts over. Yeah, that's the flexible electro-optic effect, switching through this angle thigh or theta, as we call it. Okay, now what I wanted to do in this particular device was put a field across these two electrodes, then these two electrodes, there's four electrodes there, and what happens is the molecules tilt and rotate. So you can actually make a, a phase rotator if you just sequence the, the voltage you apply across the cell, spin it round, and the tilted helix spins around. And that, that we use for a telecommunications um, so-called phase compensator. But if you only have one pair of electrodes, just take, take one pair away, then I can apply a field across the system, in plane field, so that's just the same as um, many of um, LGD, uh, just, um, I guess Hitachi's early displays. So you apply a field in the plane of the device and the helix axis tilts. Reverse the polarity and it tilts the other way. So, how does that give you a device? If you look down on the device, sorry, so this is the effect again. That was the effect that I was uh, that I'm talking about. There's your helix, and then a field uh, coming out towards you, as I've drawn it in this geometry, and the axis tilts. The tilt is always orthogonal to the field, the right angles to the field. Okay? So then you get the tilt. Reverse the polarity, and it tilts the other way. From above is where you get the difference. Because if I have no field applied across my system and a short edge, a short helix edge, a short uh, edge shorter than the wavelength of light, then looking down on the system, it looks optically isotropic. Because you have as many molecules pointing in every direction, or an equal number pointing in every direction. So it does look like water if you put it between cross polarizers. It is optically isotropic. And that gives you a black state. Apply the field in the plane of the device, and the optic axis tilts, and it becomes uniaxial. So providing you align your polarizer and analyzer 45 degrees to the field direction, you have a very useful, a very utile, a very useful display device. The black state is black. The light state can be made perfectly transmitting. And you can switch it in 20 microseconds. So it leads you to a high contrast, very fast, electric device. As if you looked at um, Flynn's poster, or if you looked at it this week, then you see some of the modeling that goes behind these devices and how good that black state actually looks. You have some photographs of the black state of a, of a display pixel. That's so how you should do that and ask them all sorts of horrible questions. Okay. Um, so, electric devices, two geometries, uniform line helix. Um, okay, that's the, the, the coil in the plane of the device, the spring on its side, if you will. 
and then the uniform standing or sloping bronze one texture. What you've got in those devices is fast responses, leads you to frame sequential color, very low fields for 45 degree tilt. In fact, it turns out that in the uniform standing helix, you don't need fields to size that to actually see the, the optical effect you want. Okay. Um, I had facile surface alignment. It is incredibly easy to align a car on a It is the easiest thing to do. You can do it as simply as taking two glass plates, putting your thumb on the glass plate, and pulling it across the surface. The grease that's in your fingers will give you a very thin, almost monolayer of alignment there. And you know that's how Merck used to test in the early 1980s their colosteric paranormatic materials. If they wanted alignment, they just put their thumb on the place and drew it across the glass. It's very easy. That's all. Okay, so it's very easy to align the USH uh, texture. I mean, in a, in a practical device, we tend to use polyamides. It depends if we want to change your own last week, the energy energy. But you can use rub nylon, nylon 6-6, you can use micro grooves, um, whichever you wish. You get a very high contrast ratio. The black state is black, and we, we have got up to about 3,000 in contrast ratio. You know, that's kind of unusual. You've got inherent grayscale because for a small voltage, small tilt. Bigger voltage, bigger tilt. Higher voltage, even higher tilt. So therefore, higher fire fringes. It gives you an inherent grayscale. It's easy to make 256 grayscales. You know, you just drive that through the electronics. Um, I think the point is, is why we, we, we make, we're trying to make, or in, in the process of making a 21-inch display device for this, is that it's a so-called drop-in technology. The beauty of the materials is you know everything, almost everything, there is to know about pneumatics. And we're using pneumatic technology by switching in ferroelectric uh, speeds. Okay? So you know how to do those things, but it's an analog switch. What I haven't talked about today, but you can actually, when you make those bimesogens, and you'll see some structures tomorrow, uh, maybe later on today to get the time, you can put dyes into the bimesogens. And in fact, the non-linear optical material I highlighted, the, the nitrosilbene, is actually a dye. And we use that in the lasing devices where we have a dye at one end of our bimesogen and a, a dielectric moiety at the other end. Okay? And then you can make all sorts of non-linear optic nitro absorbing fluorescent devices. And the real key, and what's important for energy saving, is frame sequential color. So I said right at the beginning, you can switch so fast that you don't use color filters anymore, you use LEDs. You can use bright light LEDs with a very high optical efficiencies. So you throw the color filters out. And what I'll show you with the blue phase systems, you can even throw the polarizers out. What you want to add now, I guess. Blue phases, funny things. Blue phases are a peculiar phase that form, not a peculiar phase, they form in tightly twisted chiromatics and tightly twisted semantics. Uh, it's important to, I, mean, I think Ken asked me, why, why, is the, why do you get blue phases before you get the chiromatic? And the answer is you've got a very, very twisted structure, what is called the quick answer, you've got a highly twisted structure, which, which is trying to form a chiromatic phase, but because you've got little local regions of high twist, they co-align with each other and form the so-called blue phases. But because of that, because it was a, um, almost an intermediate step, the temperature width of the blue phases was very, very narrow. One or two degrees was typical in um, other than the Mitchell tell you about. So you're used to pneumatics now, you twist them up in one D and you've got a car pneumatic and the, the, the um, directed processes around. If you get to the so-called blue phases, and there are three primary blue phases, there are other sub-phases. Um, what, what you see is, first of all, BP3 as you come down in temperature, which is so-called fog phases, so a grey sort of texture. And there are various theories about this. One, one of them is that they are non-correlated, non-aligned cubes, scattering in all directions, but very small. Uh, but there are, there are a whole range of theories if you read Peter Brooker's book on this. Um, what's interesting for the blue phases is you form these double twist cylinders where if you look down on the cylinder here, you've got molecules that are twisting around towards the center. Again, I'm trying to depict that there, and we had that last week. But you've got twist around the system. And what happens with these funny, peculiar double twist systems is they form cubic lattices of disconnections. I've drawn that over there. Uh, when these uh, cubes form, or the structures form, you get areas where you can't get alignment where you've got, uh, the director doesn't know which way to go, right in the center there, and you get isotropic material. Now, it turns out that that isotropic material is what gives you the S equals minus a half uh, 
destination mode, but it's also incredibly important, incredibly important if you want to form a stable good case. Okay? Because uh, uh, as I mentioned, you can uh, stabilize those particles. If you want to play games, you can play games with the great systems. You can put carbon nanotubes in there, um, because they don't mess if you don't treat them to make them soluble, they will try and push out a solution to so where they go, where do they go? They go to the isotropic region. Where's the isotropic region? And the S equals minus the bottom destination line. And so you put CNTs in there to stabilize the blue phase. We, we did a whole load of work using fluorosurfactants. Fluorosurfactants don't want to be in a liquid crystal. They want to be at the surface or in an isotropic region. And they will transform or, or, or remove, transport, sorry, to the S minus the bottom destination line. And they stabilize, as I'll show you, the blue phase. So, what I wanted to point out, I like this morning, is uh, we're actually using naturally occurring, okay, you can just synthesize them, photonic structures that self-assemble. I give you three-dimensional photonic, as you can see tomorrow, photonic band gaps, photonic structures. That's just a, another depiction of the, of the cubes, and therefore the explanation of the curve. So again, we use five mesogens. And there's a primary reason for this, and that these materials I've just told you have very high flexoelectric coefficients. Okay? That's mean, that means that if the system is deformed, it will have a transverse dipole, or some of the transverse dipoles, polarization across the director direction. Okay? That's the key to the flexoelectricity. So we're using materials that can deform in shape, okay, the flexoelectrics, to give you as you'll see, a wide temperature blue phase. Okay, and that, that, that if you want to look it up, there's a nice colourful, literally pretty, it's got some lovely pictures there. Paper that came out in nature a few years ago. And if you ask me again, I've got a whole raft of other, other photographs in my bag over there of the blue faces. So stabilise the systems with prime instruments. Now somebody asked me just now about artificial muscle. Um, there is something you can play games with. Here, because you can make these systems elastomeric. And in our first materials, it wasn't by accident that we had the nitrogen double bond in there. Because that azo compound, when you hit it with UV lines, as you heard last week, changed from a trans to a cis. When it changes from a trans to a cis shape, it starts to destroy the alignment. Okay. So you can actually make photochromic blue phases in crossing. You can make photochromic polysterics. And you can use ultraviolet light to tune the photonic band gaps in the in one D and in three D to come on to that. But that, that's sort of part of the tutorial nature of this uh, mm. presentation. Uh, again, I, I didn't stress it earlier, we use chiral additives, um, 1281, 1305, R101, one, uh, very high twisting power. So you only need a few percent to stabilize the system. You tend to use a mixture of, 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 of two or three of these so that if you have solubility problems, which you sometimes might have, you can get, get to your 3% by adding 1% of each, okay? Sort of just to, to, to make the system work. Okay, and that was the surprising result that um, took me a year to get published in Nature because nobody believed it. You know, I had one heck of a round with the editor. Well, no, 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 polite discussion, but she called me intemperate. I think that means I was a bit um, outspoken. Let me show you the system. Come down from high temperature, 57.4 in the system. Go down to uh, 0.3 and you start seeing the blue phase form. That's the full phase now, I'll come back to this. Then you start seeing the platelets forming. I said there's a highly twisted structure. You have lots of local structure forming because of the high twist, but it doesn't co-align because it doesn't know where to go. Okay, and then you come on down, and then here we are, 0 0.16, 0 0.17 degrees lower, and we've gone to from BP3 uh, to 2, down to 1. And then cool it down to room temperature, and it, the, the texture is the same. If you want to look at a liquid crystal texture, you make a badly aligned system. Because that tells you all of the optical information you need to know about your phase. If you make a perfectly aligned system, you just see a uniform color. And then it's hard to see transitions. But if you want to study phases, if you want to make that your hobby, it's great fun, um, then you want to make a slightly disaligned system. Put some defects into your material, and you see different orientation, different alignment, and you can tell what's in your system. And that's cu crucial to, to um, um, recognizing the blue phases. So you get these platelet textures where you formed 
carbon structures that form these cubic lattices, face centered cubic or simple cubic, and they're random in space, and they are the platelets. So the colors correspond not to impure material, but to different orientation, different order. Sorry, not different order, different directions of order. Okay, so that's stable. Okay, you go down to 20 high degrees, come back up, and you see the same sort of transition. Now, I promised to show you um, a blue face that was blue. There's not many of them are blue. Now, this is where we made a system that was actually blue reflecting. And these are um, blue phase one platelets forming. Okay, they're on about the 10 micron scale, so they are blue. And this is a, a, a material we made just to be slightly different. Because when, when I put this paper into nature, I had a lot of referees said, but you can't have a stable blue phase because it wants to be in the aromatic phase. And, and, and Flynn has actually worked out a theory, and we can go experimentally, that this, that that's an incorrect statement. And, and this is just some experimental evidence to, to show you. If you have a blue phase one, you cool it down, and it starts to try and form a chiromimetic. Okay, and then because of the structure and forces, it actually flips back to a blue phase. So it started to try and go chiromimetic. The blue phase lattice structure is stronger, and it pulls the system back to a blue phase. So it is a thermodynamically stable phase. It's not a supercooled phase. If it was supercooled, that would carry on going into a bit of chiromimetic. So it's a thermodynamically stable blue phase. Uh, phase. Okay, so what, what we saw with that material on cooling, um, we went down to, there was a expected transition way down at 16 degrees, but if you stayed in the blue phase one, came back up, then you see within a hundredth of a degree, you see reversibility of phase transitions. So it's a stable system. It's an enantiotropic system. And this is the stuff that got people excited. Because not only did you make a blue phase that was stable, and, and I should say we've made mixtures now that are stable from minus 20 Celsius up to plus 80 Celsius. So the whole range of, of a display device, that's what I'm interested in at the end of the day. Well, why am I interested? It's because if I look at the reflection properties of these materials, uh, if I have zero field across grid reflection, okay? Okay, so up here at 570 nanometers, this, this is that blue phase material. Uh, I apply a field across the system, and I increase the field, I get to a certain point where I start to deform the lattice. Now, somebody else deformed my lattice for me this morning, actually, but I, I, I had obtained yesterday um, what, a, what a blue phase tube would look like with disconnection lines. And if you apply a field, you can pull those lines apart just like you pull my device apart. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't quite work anymore. <laughs> Showing you 
that on a, di on a slightly different scale. If I turn my material into a car on pneumatic, then if I did something which I can do to the system and disrupt the structure, I could and see a pneumatic reflection that looks a bit like that. That's the blue face system. Okay? That, that, that's, in, um, that's this behavior, and that's the behavior down there in blue face uh, three and four face. To put that into a better perspective, you can make red, green, blue reflectors. So I take my chronomatic system of my, my, my mixture, so it's, it's a mixture of generic structure. And I can pitch tune the reflection and intensity. Um, there, that, that would be the um, and a chronomatic made out of the same material, and we certainly have white chronomatic reflectors. Okay, well, 35%, 40% would be good. Blue phases are up towards 50%. Much better reflectors, much stronger reflectors, but narrower bandwidth. The narrow bandwidth you know is important if you read your lectures last week, because that tells you where you can put your device on the C high color diagram. Again, I'll come to that, I'll show you a C high diagram for actual materials that we use for the lasers tomorrow. But you can make RGB and you can choose that to be wherever you like. That's just a matter of chemical composition, of twisting agent. Okay, so what you've got. Is a near 50%, 45, 50, 45, 47, whatever, percent reflector, no polarizers, no color filters. If you want to work in transmission, if you are perverse and you don't want to save energy, you can put these things between cross polarizers and you see exactly the same colors. Okay? And then if you ask me again afterwards, I'll tell you why that is. But if you want to see that sort of spectrum in transmission with a polarizer analyzer, you can do that. And you might want a transmission. Purity of color, uh, that, that's coming up, it actually is red on this, uh, my screen, but R, G, B. Those are your spectral lines, <coughs> those are the colors over, in this case I've just used about a millimeter pixels. I've gone up to centimeter square pixels. Okay, there's a process we use to align these systems, but there are no alignment layers. Okay? If you change the materials, I said flex over electricity is important, it is. If I want to change that threshold field or threshold voltage, whichever it is, I can change the materials and bring this down or take it up. That's the question of materials composition. So you can make large area model domains um, and you can reduce or increase the matter of depends what you want to do, the, the, the applied voltage by changing the materials system. So why do we think that is? Um, go back to the, the, the notion of um, this formation line. We think that the biomesogens are deforming with the director, and when they're deformed, you generate a polarization orthogonal to the molecules. So you've got three dipoles pointing in. That's electronically neutral okay, until you apply a field. When you apply a field, you distort the system, you generate polarization, and the lattice moves. By a field, you create a dipole in that structure, and the lattice cube moves. You can apply a field across the device, and with positive material, it will, it will um, dilate it and expand. If you apply an in-plane field, it will contract it goes the other way. It pulls the cube out, and so the lattice in the viewing direction comes down. So you can imagine that you can make quite nice devices where you switch fields to give you positive color or reverse. So you can go, let's say, from green to red or green to blue. Without polarizers, without filters. And I believe you will see devices of, of this type and at least prototypes in the next couple of years. So what's important? Analog control of the reflection, analog choice of the color, a threshold that for a device engineer would allow you to multiplex your system, a polarizer and color filter free. So now I am talking not about twisted dramatic where you're losing 93% of your light. I only lose 50%, 53% in a single layer. If I double layer, I lose about 10% just because the reflection of glass into faces or plastic into faces. Okay? And it's a naturally occurring system. So you can make a two-layer device. As I said, you can use it in transmission if you want to, you may need to, for your particular process. Um, and you typically, I wouldn't put them in the switching times here, but they're about milliseconds for this system. Okay. What I wanted to do, because I know some of you are interested in, in phases and phase transitions, I, I put in some extra slides late last night of showing um, transitions and what you need to look for. I get a, a lot of papers to referee for blue phases. 
I have to say that I'm afraid some of them are proof cases. You have to go through a sequence of tests to prove you have a proof case. I've seen some very narrow band of cholesterols that people say are the proof cases. They're not. You have to look at the textures. You have to look at something called the costal diagram. And you have to look at the, uh, at the thermal properties. And I'll just take you through as a sort of tutorial of what you, you might be expected to do. Here's that system coming in from blue phase, so in the, uh, coming in from isotropic phase, that's the black region. The grey is the fog phase, so that's BP3. And the platelets, these little things here, the little plates, are growing, um, uh, sorry, growing BP2 phases. Okay. Then as I come down in temperature, a little bit more, you'll, you'll see, oh, sorry, I've gone, there's a little bit more, I've gone to more platelets growing, more growing. Um, forget that slide. Um, <laughs> That was, that was to remind me to stop if I got bored. Um, so then you play that's growing away into BP2, and then down to BP1, all the way down in this case, coming down in temperatures at 22 degrees. But you do a slow transition through your, a slow temperature scan through your materials, and you should see, and make a random texture, you should see those platelets forming and growing. Okay, take your blue face structure, and measure its reflection spectrum. And if you've got a platelet structure, then you should see several narrow band peaks for each orientation of the different platelets. And that, that indeed is what you see. Okay. Depending on what uh, effect will act, if you're looking at a cube, you look at it at different um, angles, so you're looking at different cuts through the lattice. Okay. So you can be looking at 110 if you use X-ray notation, 220, etc. But that is the notation used if you, if you want to follow it. But the analog to um, scattering in blue phase is, is exactly the same location the Miller indices used in X-ray scattering. Okay. So you come there, you, you look at that, and you say, okay, yeah, I've got platelets, so I've got lots of nice narrow spectral lines. Um, Costal diagrams, it is imperative, absolutely imperative, if you want to prove you've got a blue phase, that you do a costal diagram analysis. It's the, it's the X-ray scattering at optical wavelengths. So if you've got a lattice structure, a cubic structure, Okay, and you look through your microscope, you use, uh, you use um, convergent illumination yeah, in there, and you look at the reflections or the transmission from the lattice planes. And depending on the orientation of the lattice planes, just as in X-ray scattering, you'll see a diffraction pattern. And if, if, if you actually look through the system in transmission, you see lines correspond to the lattice planes and the different orientations. And if you go back to Priansky um, a long, long time ago, produce the different patterns that you should see if you do convergent optics, you put a Bertrand lens in your collecting optics when you look in the focal plane of your um, uh, microscope and you see these patterns if you've got a blue face. If you don't see those, you haven't got one. Okay? And it's imperative to do that study. And that's what you see if you do a causal diagram. Okay, that's the uh, convergent optics, Bertrand lens, that's your diffraction formula. Those are the lines that you can see, and those are the typical patterns for the different orientations. Okay, you get these lovely X-ray light diffraction patterns. And what I've done there is show that for different wavelengths, so obviously you see constructive or non-constructive interference if, you, if you're not matching up the, the, the lattice plane with the wavelength of light. And that is exactly what you see. You see these so-called lines, which are the costal lines, that tell you you've got a cubic structure. They tell you which cube you've got and what, what orientation you've got. You can work all that out. Secondly, you can do scanning calorimetry. I'll perhaps fit through. You need to cool very slowly, and you will see slight, slight changes in your in, in your um, DSCP. If you cool too fast, you don't see them because you don't give your instrument enough time to look at them. I just that's a one. Yeah. If I if I. If I heat and cool slowly, you, you see these little peaks. If I do it too fast, so that's it's just uh, 5 degree, 0.5 degrees per minute. Maybe. Okay, then you just start to see peaks coming in. If you cool too fast, you don't see anything. And again, a lot of people cool their textures down and say, look, I've got a sandstone phase. If you don't give the chance to reach thermal equilibrium, you don't see the phase you want to see. And if you cool the blue phase systems too fast so that the uh, structure doesn't form the blue phase, it'll actually go into the it needs time for the lattices to form. Okay, and that, that's crucial to the blue face. Uh, again, that's the same, much the same. 
So what we've got is what I'm trying to show you is a generic family of liquid crystals where um, you've got, in this case, 40 degrees atmosphere for the early mixtures. But if you really, really want to do study these systems, those are the kind of things you need to do. Uh, what, I've, what I've showed you is a naturally occurring photonic band gap that can be tuned in an electric field. Uh, in principle, you can tune it in a magnetic field, but the effect would be probably far less because it's a paramagnetic system. Okay. Um, at room temperature, again, if you look at the Vince poster, I mean, no, I, I, I drew that person, I'm then, sorry. If you, if you look at it in the literature about a month's time, I hope, you'll see a theory for why this is stable. Okay. Um, the, the blue phase one goes down to 22 degrees. In fact, with a mixture we now made, it goes down to minus 20 degrees. It never goes to a current as it goes isotropic for four phases, BP, sorry, BP3, to two, to one, it stays there to a glass transition. Um, if you worry, and some people do worry about fragility of devices like because you have a fluid, you can partially, uh, when I say partially, I mean by 3%, um, cross-link this system with about 3% of reactive mesogen, and you will just give a network to the structure, a very soft network, but it holds the film and still allows all the switching. And again, with the flexoelectrics and the blue phases, if you have a lightly, very lightly um, polymer stabilized system, you see all the switching phenomena, that switching gets better for various reasons. Um, and you can make a film in a device that you can take to an isotropic phase. You can heat it way up to 150 degrees, make it isotropic, come back down, and it reforms the, the blue phase. Without, without, and, and then you can cool it fast because the net helps uh, form the phase of the, the, the structure itself. So, what I'm going to talk about in, in um, lecture three is the lasing of these systems, both the prime systems and the blue phases. So, what I'm going to tell you about tomorrow morning is what, what's lasing all about? How can you make these organics uh, give you spontaneous and uh, stimulated emission of light? What the properties are that's important? Um, how you might tune your laser? Because these organic systems, they are photonic crystals that you can deform. So, so you don't have to make a solid structure where you fix the holes in space at the grids. But you can actually manipulate the lattices around um, and make you can make the blue phase phases laser. And I'll talk to you about where, where that's at. Um, I guess I'm running. Am I right? Oh, it's okay. Yeah. I've got some motion on you. I've got some nice ones for you, if you want. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'll let me just see two days. Okay, forget that. Forget that. Right. Last week in Kindeo, we actually generated and invented a whole new form of science. It was called mesomorphic metal materials. Okay? And as you looked around life, uh, uh, I've left the geo, I do apologize. Um, then you can actually invent new materials as you look at life. Okay. There's a whole new science out there. If you look at the paving stones, you can see this plane. This plane part of the direction of the bricks and bend. Look at the bending of the director. It's play bend deformations. You can see car you can see pneumatics. If you look at the paving stones, you see the two surfaces, only a tropical alignment, then the magic phase. Okay. This is all in print now. Great stuff. <laughs> you can even see discotics in the system. <laughs> <laughs> You just have to observe it, Marsh, okay? You can see spectic A's. <laughs> you can see spectic C's. Okay? Tilted, tilted phases. There are your layer pants. There are your molecules. Tilted spectic C. You can see uh, blue phases. Okay, cubic lattices. Yeah, okay, it's all nice. So you don't invent anything. You can see even more sub phases, uh, sub, sub cubes, okay? Just to, to prove it here. You can see costal diagrams. They exist, but you can change the wavelength of the crossal diagram of your eyes, and you see another crossal diagram. <laughs> so you know you've got blue faces. Okay. You can see um, anti ferroelectrics if you use a ferroelectric, you point the molecule of the dipole across. If you look at the steps in, in um, <laughs> Ascension, you've got a scene on the steps, an anti ferroelectric phase, the pointing direction is opposite, with a, disc, with a line between the two. Okay. But better than that, you can see anti ferroelectric. Uh, and five ferroelectric, where you have one direction, another direction, you take two layers that are the same one as one, so it's ferroelectric. It's all there, you just have to observe. Okay, the moral is this. 
and a wire should stop. You're all falling asleep due to the head lunch. I hope you haven't been um, I know the chairman wants a coffee break. I know we haven't done a fire alarm test yet. We have to do that. It's another time for a group photo. <laughs> 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 um, and there's another speaker waiting after me. Um, I know that you eye campers um, are trying to sneak out before we notice. We, have, we do count how many of you are in the audience. We have a little camera. And I think I'd better stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 